Welcome to Digital Asset News, take the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets and break them down into bite-sized pieces. Today we've got some powerful stories to go over. And the first one starts with Joe Rogan is moving his podcast and everything that goes along with it, which is his 200 plus million fans, to Spotify, which means he's going to drop Apple, YouTube, and other platforms, and why I believe this is going to be a catalyst to free speech and to stop things like YouTube banning crypto channels also. Coinbase reveals the cause of the recent outages amid the peak Bitcoin and crypto trading volume. And there was two incidences, one in April and one in May before the Bitcoin halving. And why uh, there's bigger questions to be answered, such as, is this enough what Coinbase is doing or is it just too little too late and it will keep happening as the price skyrockets up? Also. Two Chinese companies are controlling 52% of Bitcoin hash rate and it leaves decentralization in question. And the question really is, is this a legitimate article or is this just FUD? And this is going to go into the root of mining and the questions need to be answered. But before we break in, let's take a look at today's market. So everything's going pretty good. This is from CoinGecko. I like this website uh, because it, it lays it down by one hour, 24 hours, seven days, 24 hour volume and market cap, which is a lot better than Coin Market Cap actually does. So I'm going to go with uh, CoinGecko. Seemed to work out pretty well. Anyhow, Bitcoin 94. Looks like it's a uh, did a little dip, but over seven days, hey, 9.4%. Not too bad. Ethereum doing uh, doing really well. 208 at 10%. Uh, Tether XRP Bitcoin Cash. Uh, down for the day uh but one of the bigger losers not big losers uh just uh, someone who took a hit will be digibyte uh if you don't uh haven't realized or haven't seen it digibyte had a massive run over the last two weeks and it was up by hundreds of percentage points it looked like there was some type of uh deal going on with some form of government uh, but that uh, story is in question. Also, uh, the founder looks like he is taking a breather. So Digibyte is going to take a hit for a while. Eh, we'll see how it goes. But uh, Digibyte, congratulations uh, for your big pump. Uh, now, hopefully, nobody FOMO'd in and uh, got wrecked. But that's how it goes for cryptocurrency. All right, let's break into today's top story. So first up, Joe Rogan. Uh, if you don't know him, uh, he must be living under a rock. I'm just kidding. Uh, Joe Rogan is a pretty popular uh, YouTube, but mostly podcaster. And he was one of the first ones to do it and do it right. And I love his show. And uh, when I saw this, I was like, I was pretty much blown away. So what it states here is uh, in a tectonic shift in the podcasting world, that's a good word, the Joe Rogan experience will be moving exclusively to Spotify later this year. And Joe Rogan states, the podcast is moving to Spotify. I signed a multi-year licensing agreement with Spotify. So he's not giving up all his content. He just has a license agreement to go exclusively onto Spotify. So good for him. On September 1st, Joe Rogan's entire library of content will be available on the platform. And later this year, at some undisclosed point, all audio and video will only be available via Spotify. In spring 2019, Rogan said his podcast had over 190 million monthly downloads. That's a boatload. It's certainly grown since then, and top episodes get millions of additional views on YouTube, which is where I see all of his stuff, meaning his, he's likely over 200 million monthly listens and views. This video announcement is particularly major because Joe Rogan has 8 million subscribers on YouTube, which could translate into hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue for him monthly on top of any type of sponsorship deals that he gets, and they are numerous, which is likely to largely go away over time since he's going to go into Spotify. Now, I don't know the details of uh, uh, what's going on with the deal with Spotify as far as uh, affiliates and uh, promotions, but uh, I can tell that uh, those probably have been cut back if he's if Spotify is going to give him $100 million. So I just got to tell you, like, I like Joe Rogan. I like his podcast, and uh, I've learned a lot and taken a lot of lessons from what I've seen. See, what, what Joe does, he, he does it very smartly. Uh, he gets opinions from uh, a wide swath of people. Uh, like he had Andreas Antonopoulos on, and uh, he also has somebody like Peter Schiff on. So there, those are two corresponding views. He's had people as far left as Bernie Sanders and as far right as Alex Jones. And he's also had people on, like Bob Lazar, who are, are talking about uh, UFOs, which I, I am also interested in because I find it fascinating. So 
This is why on this channel I try to get as many viewpoints as I can and not live inside the echo chamber, which is just the same thing going over and over again. And you're just kind of like reinforcing your own views because that's what you keep hearing again and again and again and again. So I think if you wanted that type of channel, uh, you wouldn't. You would listen to other YouTubers who tell you everything is going to the moon, or this altcoin is going to a thousand x, or just invest in this crazy project and you'll be rich by tomorrow. Um, but I'm not that channel, and I think it's why we went from zero to almost sixty thousand subscribers uh, in in six months. So um, I've taken good lessons from Joe. Uh, he's he does it right. I see the benefit of getting a lot of different viewpoints, and that's why I try to bring to this channel. All right, let's move on. So scrolling down, scrolling down, it'll be, Joe said it'll be the exact same show. I'm not going to be an employee of Spotify. We're going to be working with the same crew doing the exact same thing. And the show will continue to be free. And uh, I like that. So to me, I think this is huge news. This is huge, not just for Joe, because he's going to be, you know, 100 millionaire, good for him. Uh, but Apple, you have to understand, Apple and YouTube were really the only game in town. But that ends today right now like there's other platforms that, that people talk about like dtube and cinnamon and those type of things and i can tell you i'm on there and uh, i get a whopping like 20 views <laughs> every video that i put out so it's just not there as it could be but uh, i think this is new this is huge because it's going to play a huge role as far as censorship so you're not going to see junk like this going on where youtube uh bans crypto channels this was back in uh december this was uh was it december or no, March 2020. This is when Ivan on Tech and the Moon got banned uh, because they something with sale of regulated goods and services policy. And the Moon and Ivan on Tech were just talking about uh, you know Bitcoin and how things were going to go up or down, whatever they were talking about. And it wasn't about you know. Uh, regulated goods and services policy just that uh, they just banned them now they got their channel back obviously they're still up but that's a problem and this has also been a problem back on december in 2019 these were all the different channels that were affected either they got strikes or they got put out out of commission now uh, I don't know if all those strikes have gone away, but this is a lot of people and it was all targeted towards one specific area. So that is, in essence, censorship. And then you can see it not just in crypto channels, but just YouTube channels in general. Uh, there was a new one uh, with London, London Real. I know I say it London Real. I just like to say it London Real. But London Real, uh, they had David Ick, who is kind of out there. He's a little, little nutty. And he's got different things about lizard people and 5G is going to destroy the world and whatever else. Look, that's I'm, that's a debate for a whole other video. I'm not here to debate that. What I'm just saying is that uh, YouTube has the power to shut these things down. Now, before I move on, I will say this. Um, I appreciate YouTube. I do. Because we are not in North Korea. We are not in parts of China where everything is locked down. You can't you know, uh, go against the state. Uh, you can actually... Get your voice out there. The problem is, is what we're seeing is that sometimes more and more, uh, because you know you have to enforce some types of rules, that uh, things get banned and things sometimes go a little bit too overboard, and uh, things get shut down. So, I think this is a great thing uh, as far as like um, for Joe Rogan for free speech and for maybe uh, loosening up some restrictions that YouTube has. But uh, only time will tell. Now, to me, this move that Joe Rogan did, some people just say, ah, it's, you know, it's good for him, 100 million and whatever else, it's not going to affect too much. But you have to understand the ramifications. To me, this move is a catalyst for more platforms to feature crypto and digital, digital asset information. It just takes one heavy hitter like Joe Rogan to make a huge move. And he made a big move. I mean, can you imagine going through those uh, debates and through those negotiations and going, okay, we want to do this and this and that. It probably took a long time. Probably took at least six months to a year to get this thing going. And uh, I'm glad he pulled the trigger. So if you think about, well, what's going to happen as far as this heavy hitter? Well, the same thing could be said about Howard Stern and satellite radio. And and uh, I just want you to, to walk down with me a uh, little, little uh, history lesson. So this was a, an article I found, and it looks awful because it was 
created in October 6, 2004. And that's why it looks so weird because we're not used to looking at websites like this. But uh, this was in 2004, Howard Stern said, look, I'm jumping ship. I'm going from terrestrial radio, uh, just the regular radio stations that we listen to, to satellite radio. And people thought that was crazy. Just like I'm sure people like uh, are going, Joe, why are you leaving, uh, you know, YouTube and all the different podcasts going just to Spotify. And uh, the same thing happened with Howard Stern. They thought that no one would follow him over to satellite radio because it was kind of an unproven thing. And uh, what happened was, well, in 2005, uh, uh, Sirius XM Holdings, they were worth $242 million. And then in 2006, when Howard Stern came there, almost tripled. And then from there, 2007, it went up to $922 million. And then from there, you can see what's going on these days. So Sirius XM, because it was a merger, they went from 5.4 billion, and that was in 2016, to 5.7 billion, to 7.7 billion, to now almost 12, or sorry, uh, 8 billion, uh, which is year over year. And this is for the uh, Q1, they made 2 billion. So they're probably on track for their $8 billion uh, a year. So just by getting one major player, everything shifted. So all the different power that was in the terrestrial radio, and you had to kind of go that route, is the same thing I see with uh, YouTube and uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you only have those two games in town. And to me, I think that's bad. So if you have something like this, and not to mention that because Howard Stern went over, uh, that forced the merger of Sirius and XM. If you don't remember, Sirius and XM were two different satellite radios. And because of that, uh, they had to merge and they you know, became a, pretty big deal. So when people just see Joe Rogan moving and making a lot of money, I don't see it that way. I see it as a big catalyst uh, for an ever expansion and hopefully not so much uh, banning of uh, YouTube, uh, sorry, of crypto and digital asset channels. Just a thought. Let me know what you think in the comments section. Let's move on to the next article. So next up, Coinbase reveals cause of recent outages amid peak Bitcoin and crypto trading volume. And uh, I don't like using Daily HODL, uh, their website, because they don't allow me to uh, uh, highlight anything, which sucks. So what I like to do is go to the actual story, which is on the Coinbase blog. So this is what they say. Um, this was, let me see here. This was written by Jesse Pollock, head of engineering. And he says there was two incidences. One was April 29th. And he, he talks about from 1028 uh, PD time to 1040 PD time uh, on April 29th, the API that powers Coinbase.com and our mobile applications become unavailable for our, cons our customers globally. This is followed by 30 minutes of stability, then a period of instability from 1112 to 1211, during which we sustained 20 minutes of full unavailability and 40 minutes of degraded performance with elevated error rates. But he says at 12.11, full service was restored. So really, as I'm seeing this, I'm like, that's eh, not too bad. I mean, look, it's like an hour. Not too, I mean, that's not too bad. So an hour, I mean, what a bummer. However, when they go on to talk about what it was that caused this, it, it, it caused me to think about some actual questions. Like, first of all, how does this happen? Why does this happen? You're a billion dollar company. You should be prepared for this. Okay, so he states the initial in incident was triggered at 1728 PDT by an increase in the rate of connections to one of our primary databases. So a lot of people coming in. Great. This connection rate increase was a result of a deploy creating new connections while our systems were scaled to respond to elevated traffic at the time. When this spike in connections occurred, the host operating system for the database began rejecting new TCP connections to the host, which triggered degraded operations and restarts in the rotting layer of the debate for the database. So about half of that, what I read, I understood. I'm not an IT person or super technical. So here's the question. Uh, if you're a programmer or an IT expert uh, listening to this video right now, you, does this make sense to you? And the real question to me is, if you're a billion dollar company, and you had problems in 2017 with, with everything shutting down because of the huge parabolic bull run. Uh, what could have been done differently to make sure this did not happen? Because in actuality, you should be having um, you know tech services and everything else going through there and doing uh, some type of checks and balances or some type of testing. I'm assuming that they do that. But really to this point, if you are that big of a company and we know what has happened in 2012, 
after the halving, 2013 was a big year. 2016, after the halving, 2017 was a big year. And now 2020, after the halving, we're looking at 2021 for another big year. What the heck is going on? That's just a question. So a uh, fringe conspiracy theory might think, hey, maybe it's okay to let people not cash out when the when the price spikes. Just a thought. Just saying. Just put it out there. Anyhow, let's go to the next incident. So that was on May 9th. And he states from 1717 PDT to 1800, the API that powers Coinbase and our mobile application space an elevated error rate. The error rate peaked at 1724 and gradually decayed until the issue was resolved at 1800. So again, not too bad, right? We're looking at about an hour or, or so. So um, to me, there was a lot of different things written about this. But when I look at what has happened, as far as like we had an hour here and an hour there. All right. The question is, is that is it that big of a deal or is it a subset of people making it a big deal? Or where there's smoke, there's fire. Because if you have one issue here, what can happen when a real parabolic bull run happens? Can you handle it, Coinbase? And it makes you suspect. I'm just saying. Anyhow, yeah, this article states, we identified, or sorry, uh, this is from Paul Key states, we identified that the increase in latency was due to instance level rate limiting of the DNS queries used to serve these HTTP requests. As traffic reduced due to the error rate, we dipped below the rate limit, leading to the gradual decay of the error rate. Sounds so good. Sounds so uh, simple, right? Beyond addressing the specific root cause of this incident, we are making a number of improvements to increase availability in the future. Here's what they're going to do. Three things. First, adjusting their health check logic to ensure that saturated but otherwise healthy application instances are not automatically removed from the load balancer. Second, though this incident impacted all HTTP requests, we're rolling on improved tooling to ensure we can quickly identify and shut down errant external services that increase latency. Finally, as with 420 Instant, we're rolling out safeguards that will allow us to contain the impact of future HTTP failures to a small or subset of requests as possible. So when I'm reading that, I just realized how non-English that sounded. So I will just say this, Coinbase, if you're listening to my channel, which I doubt, but you know, maybe somebody is. This gentleman, Pollock, is a pretty smart guy, but he doesn't really speak the majority of language unless you are into IT or programming or something like that. Great good job on Pollock, but could you have someone to put it in English for stupid people like myself? That's all I'm asking for. Uh, and the next question is this. Again, it's the same thing, really. Should a billion dollar company do continued testing to make sure that these outages don't happen and be proactive instead of reactive? Or do we accept the fact that people and to a greater extent companies are not perfect and should be allowed to correct and learn from their mistakes? That's a pretty uh, uh, deep question, but go ahead and let me uh, know what you think in the comment section. I would love to hear this answer. And then uh, lastly, uh, I will just say that uh, you would think that the fees that they're charging, they could be a little more proactive, I'm just saying. And uh, I talked about this yesterday. Um, in the description, I have put a Google spreadsheet which talks about all the exchange fees. And what I'm trying to do is load these up with the different exchanges and different apps that are out there and talk about what the actual exchange fees are. Now, I've got this. You can click on the... In where it says click here for fee chart for Coinbase. This is from the actual Coinbase website. And the Cash App is also from the, the Cash App uh, blog where it talks about their fees and structures. So this is the information that I have. If there's anything incorrect, please let me know. Uh, put that in the comment section. That would help. And uh, I made a mistake yesterday. I didn't have this little share button on. <laughs> I didn't have it shared to uh, for everybody, so now it's uh, you're able to get it. Because when I woke up today, I looked at my email and I had like uh, 50 or 100 different emails asking me for access, and I just made a mistake. So my fault. But now you can go in the description, click on the link, and it's all it's going to be there. All right, last article. So two Chinese companies controlling 52% of Bitcoin hash rate leaves decentralization in question. Interesting. So I'm not going to read this whole thing because. It was about as dry as the last one. I really shouldn't have read the last one. That was way too much. But what it comes down to is this. This is this is the graph, the pie chart, which kind of lays out all the hash rate power uh, for Bitcoin. And there's uh, some mining pools that uh, have taken control. So it's important to note 
that because when I'm looking at this, I'm like, okay, you got F2 pool at 21 and pool at 16, BTC at 15, pool in OKX and blah 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 blah. So I'm like, okay, well, it's not there's not a majority here, but it's it's pretty interesting. It says here, and it's important to note that Ant Pool and BTC.com are both part of Bitmain. So uh, Bitmain is this and this. So what is that? 31 percent and plus 28 or 21, almost 22. So yeah. Makes sense. Uh, that's a lot of uh, hash power in the in, in the hands of uh, two uh, mining pools. Just saying. So every time I do this, I, I have to ask these questions, which is: uh, Is Bitcoin becoming more centralized, or is this just a fud article? That's the that's the big question. And before you answer, I want you to think about it. Uh, we're not trying to have crypto dogma here, which is Bitcoin or nothing. XRP or nothing, Ethereum or nothing, tomato coin or nothing, or whatever it is that you're into. I I, I don't know. But uh, is this becoming more centralized? And I know that as far as miners go, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, miners have the ability to go to any mining pool that they want to. They can leave this, they can leave BTC at the drop of a hat and pull a drop of a hat. Any of these, they, they can just go. The question though is, where are you going to go? Because right now the cheapest electricity is in China. So if you don't have that, uh, ability to have cheap electricity would you go to some other place on your principles of not wanting it to be centralized uh, but you would lose out on profits or would you just stay in china and be like you know what this city in china for hydroelectric power is really cheap and uh, i'm making more money so i'm just going to stay there that's the first question second question is even though there is all these mining pools uh collected into 52 percent uh does it really make a difference can there be a 51% attack uh, can they just go against the you know the, the whole system and why would they even do it that's the real question so let me know in the comment section it's a little bit deeper but let me know and then that, the, the, the next one is when I when I'm reading about this I think to myself what about ETH what about Ethereum 2.0 because we just did a, a video yesterday and I mean the first big uh, story was we took a look at Grayscale the CEO where Grayscale essentially uh, has ownership now of one third or 33 percent of all Bitcoin mined in like the last two or three months uh, it was it was an amazing story I mean I can't believe that one company uh, one hedge fund uh, Grayscale is buying up everything that was the first part the second part is we took a look at ETH 2.0 and there was two different articles which simplified it from uh, Coindesk I think it was and the other one we took a look at consensus uh, FAC uh, frequently asked questions section which was more detailed and we just took a look at what was going on as far as staking because Ethereum is going from proof, proof of work like what Bitcoin uses to now proof of stake and how to use that and how to get a validator and uh, how much Ethereum you need which is 32 and all that good stuff so uh, definitely take a look at that I'll link that at the very end of this video but anyhow the question I have then is with Ethereum 2.0 going to proof of stake will this lead to more decentralization because in this article it talks about this is the plan the plan is to move away from proof of work because it is uh, you know it, uh, energy consumption is high and then it leads to centralization debatable uh, but the other debate, I guess, would be, is this going to push Ethereum 2.0 or Ethereum up above that number one spot, above Bitcoin? And before you go crazy, is that blasphemy? Is that just craziness talk? Or do you think that'll never happen? Uh, let me know, not just yes or no, but tell me exactly why. That's the big question. Why? Give me some facts. That'd be interesting. Because in cryptocurrency digital assets, you just never know. All right. <clears throat> so that's it for today's video. I want to say thanks for sticking with me through all the rants. I also would like to say thank to all my supporters. Um, I really appreciate it. Now, if you don't know, uh, there's a little join button at the bottom. I don't, uh, I mean, it should be, it should say tips because it's not a join because you're not getting anything special. It's just, uh, um, you know, if you want to put in a couple bucks, that's what level one does. And it's like a tip like, hey, thanks. Good video. And I appreciate it. I really do. Then level two, you pay a little bit more, but I give you a shout out. So uh, shout outs all right soft, my man. Uh, myself, who else? Dave Plummer, the straight talking guy. Check out his uh, YouTube uh, video. Interesting, interesting stuff. Grant Sharman, uh, also level two. We got Bruce Wood, Baking Benjamins, the third best handle. Uh, of, of, of all my subscribers right next to uh, Wynn Mullet and McLovin. I love that one. Baking Benjamins. 
Noel Flippin' Vegas, Martin Lewin, and Michael Ralph. So thanks all my supporters and thanks to you for sticking with me through this whole uh, video. If you like these types of videos, there's gonna be two that's gonna pop up on your left and right. Not sure which ones, because YouTube kind of controls that part. And that's it. So uh, thanks for sticking with me and I will see you on the next one.